Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, lovely fall day. I'm Amanda Perez, and I'm with the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training here at the University of Oregon. Um, today, we are so happy to have Amy Zelliga joining us. Um, I'll give you just a short rundown on her. So Amy is um, an autism consultant, a special education teacher, and a board certified behavior um, analyst. She's been working at Southern Oregon ESD for the past four years. Before moving to Southern Oregon, Amy spent 19 years working in specialized schools in New York City for students with autism and other disabilities. And when she's not working in school, she's surfing on the coast. Um, so just a couple little housekeeping things as we're getting going. Um, today, we're gonna to be using a couple different functions of Zoom. So if you have any type of technical issues, please use your chat. You'll see that in the bubble at the bottom of your screen. Uh, some of you might see it on your right side um, navigation bar too. So if you do have any of those questions, I am here to help you with that as well. Um, we also have Q&A enabled. So if you do have specific questions that you would like um, Amy to respond to, please put them in there as you're thinking of them. Um, if you're anything like me, then you will forget them by the time the questions are available. And we really want to be able to respond to you. So please use your Q&A. We would like to hear from you and we really want to include you in this process. There'll be a couple of different spots that we'll be pausing as we go along. The other thing that we'll be using this time is polling. So occasionally we'll be asking you a quick question and you'll see that poll pop up on your screen. They're pretty short uh, polls, so just make sure you answer them um, as they pop up. There'll only be four of them throughout this particular one and then we'll be ready to go. So with that said, Amy, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, we are talking about distance learning resources for students with learning differences. Um, so what hopefully our goals today, um, as Amanda mentioned, we'll be using some polls. Um, we're just going to do a brief review of some challenges that students may encounter with distance learning and an overview of some websites that might be helpful resources um, that teachers and you know anyone supporting students might want to utilize during distance learning. And I have a little sample um, of how you may put them together and add additional visual supports. Um, I just want to give you a little background on um, where I come from and you may be asking yourself why am I listening to an autism consultant um, for distance learning, um, but we um, are from Southern Oregon Education Service Department. Um, I'm part of the autism team and we provide regional services um, to districts throughout Southern Oregon. Um, we provide evaluations for kids with autism early childhood to 21. And um, a lot of our job is consult consultation to teachers and school staff. So providing um, in-class supports, social skills materials, different kinds of visual supports, um, providing trainings like this, and in some cases doing small groups of social skill, um, social thinking groups or social skills groups for small groups of students. Um, what we do notice is that um, many of our students, there's overlap um, in the learning challenges that students with autism experience and students with other learning differences experience. Um, and what we wanted to do, I'm giving you just a little background on our social skills CART project. Um, we started this in 2016. And what we did was collect social thinking materials um, to make them universal across districts, um, across classrooms within districts, um, so that students would have some consistency with social thinking language, with self-regulation language, um, and different kinds of skill building tools to express how they're feeling. Um, we use things like the five point scale or the zones of regulation. Um, so what we did was create kits, um, separated them into elementary and middle high school um, materials, and each kit contained um, different books from um, different companies, games, posters, fidgets, and a content binder. Um, we also provided training um, to anyone who was receiving these carts. Um, so the, these are some of the contents of the carts that um, the kids included. So um, for you know, younger students who are learning to be able to function in a group setting, um, we're talking about social thinking, we're talking about self-regulation, um, for older students, we're talking about those hidden social skills, um, different kinds of social boundaries, and you know, just figuring out the size of the problem, um, the size of your reaction, 
and um, you know, just being able to regulate in class. Um, so that's kind of my background and where we're coming from. And we will incorporate some of these um, concepts into our webinar today. But first, I just want to get our first poll up um, to see who's here and, and what your background is. So I know who's in the room. And if you have a role that is not on here, um, if you're a parent or if you have some kind of other role within a school district um, or if you're working privately in a clinic, um, you can put that in the chat. So Amy, are you able to see the response in the polls in progress? Um, I'm only able to see um, just the, the poll itself, um, but I can't see the responses yet. Okay, so we are at about 81% of respondents. Um, so it looks like we've got 50% uh, special educators. We have no general education teachers, 5% education assistants, 36% education behavior support, and 8% administrators. Excellent. And I'm noticing in the chat we have some speech language pathologists, um, OTs, um, and some early childhood and a school nurse. Um, so we definitely have a, a broad range. So hopefully some of these tools will, will be helpful to everyone. And there's our poll results. So there's a brief snapshot, so I'll stop sharing that. Thanks. All right, so previously we were doing, you know, some social skills groups in, in classrooms and collaborating with teachers and consulting, and then 2020 happened. Um, and, you know, for some people, we might still be in the dumpster fire area. Um, and for other people, we're kind of in a combination of everything. Um, what we did notice um, when schools closed for us in March, um, we kind of just got thrown into distance learning and everyone was just trying to do the best they could, um, scrambling for different resources and now moving into the fall, um, you know, in, in some districts, um, they're still participating in distance learning and some are you know, either doing like a hybrid or um, if they're able to, they're, they're in face-to-face -face learning. Um, but what we know is that, you know, the building blocks for social development, um, and these are for all learners, not just kids with autism or learning differences, um, all learners need these skills. And this is from Michelle Garcia Winner's um, Social Thinking. Um, and what we see at the top here is, is learning as part of a group. And all of these blocks contain skills that are interrelated in and interdependent. Um, they contribute to being able to listen in a classroom, um, be able to formulate language, written language, um, and you know, complete multi-step tasks. So we have a, a building block for executive function. We have a building block for self-regulation, um, for emotional engagement for language, um, for perspective taking, and way, way, way at the top, we have learning as part of a group. Um, so all of these concepts are, are things that all students need. Um, students with learning differences, if they have um, you know, a traumatic brain injury, or if they have ADHD or autism, we know that some of these skills, we're going to see gaps. Um, and you know, kids are really good at masking those gaps. Um, but it does affect their social communication, it affects their self-regulation, it affects their ability to organize themselves um, and plan activities. So sometimes our kids, you know, can appear more skilled than they actually are, especially if they're highly verbal. Um, they kind of give that, um, you know, kind of making people assume that they know what they're doing. Um, you know, if they're talking a lot, they're talking through um, the problems or trying to negotiate. 
Um, but what's really happening is that they're, they're disorganized. Um, they're, they're not able to plan and execute an activity. Um, and in distance learning, some of those things are really highlighted. Um, they have a little bit more, um, you know, let's say less support um, in the areas of executive function because they're not in a face-to-face -face learning situation. They're not in a classroom where a teacher is saying, hey, um, let's open your binder and find that assignment. Um, they're expected to go on Canvas or whatever the distance learning platform is and um, turn in those assignments. Um, some of the things that they're expected to do independently at home with or without a parent um, are things that they might have been doing in a really small classroom setting with a teacher or an educational assistant present. Um, so when we know that there's gaps in the skills, um, we know that there's going to be a breakdown. Um, and then if you add distance learning on top of that, I kind of just added, <laughs> and I have it teetering at the top. Um, what we learned from our, our original school closure in March is it's an added set of skills for all students. Um, it can definitely be harder for students to stay engaged. Um, we had a lot of parents report that their students were more anxious, um, you know, in response to having to be on Zoom or just more anxious in general. Um, it's, it wasn't just distance learning. It's, you know, the idea that, that COVID is out there and we have to social distance and all of those activities that they might do in the community, um, they may not be doing anymore. Um, so, and also what we noticed is that since students are not going to school, um, you know, five days a week for, you know, a certain amount of hours every day, um, parents who previously mentioned behavior concerns, um, you know, that they could, they could probably live with them, um, you know, and they weren't that prevalent on Saturdays and Sundays, they are now experiencing those behavior concerns on a daily basis. Um, so they, they also need tools to help their students be successful from the home setting. Um, so what our goal was basically was to provide um, students and teachers with a way to create structure within the distance learning platform. Um, continue to provide self-regulation tools that were familiar um, and, and not to overwhelm everyone with extra things that they needed to look at. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could um, find a way that students can demonstrate what they know um, via a virtual learning platform. And we wanted to take into consideration all of the challenges that come along with that. So we got to work. <laughs> Um, we started looking for resources that would be um, similar to what we were using already in the classroom, similar to what we were providing um, to teachers, um, materials that were similar to what was in the social skills carts, because those materials were um, physical, you know, books and, and, you know, physical pen paper kinds of activities. Um, we didn't have a lot of things that were able to um, you know, just be, be sent via email. So how could we create those? Um, how can we replicate those and, and be able to present them via Zoom? Um, and what we started with um, when we did distance learning in the spring um, was just working on the same skills we always did um, and just getting students used to um, the distance learning platform with the same information that they would be engaging with in, in the face-to-face -face setting. Um, so, Amanda, can we do our second poll? Um, I think that we have a question about um, concerns for distance learning. Yeah. So I just want to get an idea of how people are feeling with distance learning um, and, and how, you know, how it's, it's progressed um, over, you know, over the time that we've been engaging in that. Answers are still coming in. Okay. I'll end in just a moment. It looks like the majority though are at, it's not my preference. Okay. Okay, it looks like response is slowing down. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll and share it with you. Okay. All right, I like I like the 23% better than expected. I'm glad that we have some some optimism out there. And I, I definitely feel for the 13% that are saying I hate it. Um, 
we we definitely know it's it's not the preference and it's not it's not something that is ideal especially for special educators um you know we are constantly breaking down tasks um it's definitely easier to be in person um, so that we can demonstrate and model effectively um, some of the things that we've learned um, from distance learning is that everything, everything needed to slow down. Um, the pace and the volume of the content presented um, needs to slow down during distance learning. Um, you know, when you're in a in a face to face learning setting, we have, you know, visuals that we're all, you know, showing to students, we have um, other students that our students can reference as models. Um, they can read the room and, and then notice what other people are doing. Um, those environmental cues are no longer there. Um, so for students that have you know, issues with memory recall or if they have processing issues with language, um, we definitely need to slow down. Um, you know, when we're talking on Zoom, it's, it's easy to just keep talking. Um, you know, accounting for uh, technology lag, um, our students may not always be getting this, the, the amount of information we think that we're putting out. Um, so we want to make sure we have some checks for understanding. So asking questions and, and asking students, not just did you understand that, um, but asking what did you hear and having them repeat it back to us um, so that we know that they are actually understanding the directions or they are able to um, you know, repeat the content that they've just heard. Um, our students need shorter lessons. Um, so, you know, normally if we were doing a social skills activity, it might be 30 minutes, um, you know, breaking that down to 15 minutes um, and then giving students more frequent breaks away from the computer. Um, you know, we know the learning fatigue is, is definitely increased on Zoom for both students and adults. Um, when we're staring at a screen all day, I know if I have a long day of multiple Zooms, um, my eyes hurt afterwards and, and I feel a lot more tired than I, I typically would in a regular work day if I was visiting schools. Um, so keeping that in mind that our students are experiencing those same things. Um, we want to make sure we're monitoring their emotions, um, you know, making sure that we are not having extreme anxiety or any kind of mental health concerns. Um, it is isolating to be at home all the time and, and log on to um, Zoom meetings. It, it's, it's a lot different than being in a face-to-face -face classroom setting. Um, we want to make sure that what we're presenting um, is easy for students to visually track. And if you know you can adjust screen settings so that the brightness and the speaker view in Zoom um, is is not as um, agitating for for students' eyes. And I just wanted to alert you to a handout um, that we have. Um, I believe Amanda sent it out to you, and I'm hoping you're able to see this. Um, but it's a it's a list um, from Siebert. It's a distance online learning for students with concussion and brain injury. And it, it's a great list that just gives a lot of recommended resources and a lot of it just alerts you to um, some of the issues that students with a brain injury may have related to um, distance learning. All right, and I just wanted to put this out there um, to camera or not to camera. And I know it's difficult to measure engagement sometimes when students' cameras are not on, um, but we do have a lot of students that, um, you know, they report they have a lot of anxiety around having a camera on. Um, and so we, we definitely want to make sure that, you know, our students are at a comfort level where, where they will participate. Um, and maybe we need to work up to having our camera on. Um, we can, you know, consider anxiety levels, the amount of visual input a student's able to process. Um, it's really overwhelming to watch, you know, however many other students are on, on the gallery view setting. Um, it's really distracting. You know, normally in a face-to-face -face setting, we might be facing, you know, four or five other people, but we're, we're focused on our immediate work area um, you know, classrooms are set up so that we have 
physical barriers to decrease distraction. Um, and, you know, we're all generally looking in the same direction. We're not constantly looking at each other. Um, that's a lot of visual input to um, process and it's a lot of facial expressions and body language to try to interpret. Um, not to mention, you know, whatever's going on in the background. Um, so consider speaker view versus gallery view for students that might be helpful. Um, and just building rapport and motivation to encourage students to participate first before making video on a requirement. Um, some of the things that um, other students have done, you know, they, they're participating beautifully in the chat or they're showing reactions. They may be holding up um, visual cards that have already been sent home as a way to participate. Um, but as long as they're present and they're listening and we have a way to communicate with them um, to make sure that they are engaged and we can see that they are actually, you know, turning in assignments and contributing, um, you know, they don't always need to have their camera on. And the other part that we know is that, um, you know, all internet is not created equal. Um, students may not have access to a camera. Um, and, and students may not want to show um, the setting that they're in. Um, you know, they, do, they may not want to show what, what the background is um, of the location where they're living. Um, here in Oregon, we have, you know, multiple families that have been displaced through wildfires. Um, so they're living in different locations. They might be living in a hotel. They might be living with multiple people. Um, so there might not be a lot of opportunities for privacy. Um, so just take those into consideration. Um, I just wanted to give you this resource. Um, Emily Rubin, um, she was um, operating out of the Marcus Autism Center, and she is one of the co-creators of SEEKS. Um, and that stands for Social Emotional Engagement, Knowledge, and Skills. Um, and what she would do is measure student engagement in classrooms. Um, and she would do this in special education classrooms or in general education settings. Um, and what she's looking at is student investment. So are they interested in the content? Do they have a relationship or a connection with their teacher? Um, are they initiating? So what ways are they able to show what they know? Um, and are they independent? So do they know what's expected of them? Are they able to plan and carry out a task? Um, and what she did was create um, this document, which is supporting engagement in the virtual learning environment. And she just has some suggestions for investment, independence, and initiation, and how that could look um, over a distance learning platform versus a face-to-face -face learning situation. Um, so she has some suggestions about offering choices, um, still connecting real life lessons. Um, she particularly does note, um, you know, having video on, um, but as I said previously, that, that doesn't have to be an option. There's lots of ways that we can measure engagement without having a video on. Um, so if we look over at initiation, um, you know, she has suggestions like students paired into dyads or like breakout rooms, um, giving students end of lesson polls or they can access the Zoom polls um, if teachers have that opportunity, um, or even just a, a Google form, filling out a Google form at the end or as a check-in. How are you feeling today? Um, do you think you need to speak to a teacher? Um, sometimes those Google forms are related to the zones of regulation or the five-point scale. Um, and then independence. So, you know, typically in a face-to-face -face setting, we would have students who are um, following visual schedules. They may have, you know, a to-do list or some kind of checklist for homework. So making sure that those are still available in the distance learning setting on, on an actual Zoom platform. So when teachers are presenting um, different expectations to make sure that they're actually pairing those things with visuals with to do lists and and things like that. So here's what we came up with. Um, we we found that basically the amount of resources out there are so overwhelming. Um, so I've picked four <laughs> um, that we have figured out to be the most successful for students. Um, and there's a little disclaimer um, that 
Uh, these will work for in-person learning too. So if you're in a situation where you may be, um, you know, transitioning back and forth from in-person to face-to-face -face learning and back again, um, these four websites can be used in both settings. Um, they're easy to share with families um, and, and basically they're, they're kind of allowing us to do what we used to do, um, you know, on, on a virtual platform. So our first website is the Social Thinking website, and this is Michelle Garcia Winner's website. Um, she has some of her books, um, some of the books like the We Thinker series, um, if you're familiar with Superflex books, um, she has um, some of them on her website under a free stuff section um, as, as read alouds. Um, so you can just go on there and you can check out some of the read alouds that they have. Um, and, and these are things that you can easily screen share and play um, a little bit at a, a, you know, a short amount at a time um, on Zoom. Um, they have a body out of the group story about social distancing, which explains that the hidden rules have changed. Um, and it's using the same characters from some of her other books. Um, there's also books and materials for purchase, and she also has a variety of webinars that are really, really helpful um, for teachers and for parents based around social thinking concepts, um, but also based around executive functioning and self-regulation and how to manage anxiety in social settings. Um, so there's a lot of good resources available. Some of the webinars are free and some of the webinars you have to purchase. Um, but if you go to the free stuff section, you'll find a lot of these read aloud books um, and there may be some PDF worksheets that you're able to download. Um, the next website is called Mission Cognition and they are a company out of New Jersey um, that actually do behavior analytically based social skills groups. So it's um, a group of behavior analysts. They run social skills groups for various age levels. And when the school closures happened in March, they went to work on trying to figure out how to do everything virtually. Um, and they came up with a few really great webinars um, and I just have them here. Um, on their website, they should still be available. Um, just increasing interaction um, during virtual schooling and how to run virtual social skills groups. Um, and what they did is they came up with a lot of these uh, Google slide bundles um, that you can intermix the activities and you can, um, you know, present them like, like we're doing right now. Um, so you're able to purchase some of the slides separately. Um, you know, the, the Google Slides, um, they run from like $3 to a $36 bundle, and the bundle might contain data collection. Um, there might be an instructional video for um, teachers or for therapists, whoever's doing the implementation, um, just giving some tips on how to present the content, what you might be looking for, and if you want to use the data collection materials to measure um, progress. Um, there's some explanations there. Um, so some of their um, Google Slides, I just brought you up a couple of samples here. Um, one of them is a game board bundle, and they inserted a little YouTube uh, roll a dice um, you know, video here. So what you would be able to do is actually play it, um, and you, know, you can have the kids yell out stop, and you can stop it. Um, and if you're not in presentation mode, so let's see if this will work. Um, oh, hold on. If you're not in presentation mode, um, what you would be able to do is create shapes in Google, um, in Google Slides, and you can actually make these the game pieces. Um, so if I exit from here, let me just try to do this for you. Um, so if you, um, create a shape so you can hit insert and actually make a shape and the students can pick their shape, their color, and these are movable. So if we had a student that rolled a four, you can make it, you can move it to four and then you can read off that, that game board um, activity. So name an activity that helps you feel calm. And these actually come blank. So you're able to type in whatever content you want into these game boards um, and you can interchange them um, and you can just make it relevant to the students that you're actually working with. 
Um, for some students, uh, you know, in our in our social skills groups, we might have been working on really specific targets or really specific tasks. So this slide I just put in to show that, you know, we may be offering multiple opportunities for students to practice a skill. And this is just follow up questions. So practicing conversational skills, um, we might be working on asking questions to show interest or to get more information. And here's just a few of the WH questions we might be targeting. Um, so what we would say to someone is, you know, we would present this and we would say, hey, if someone said this to you, what would you want to know? And we would just have an opportunity here. Um, you're not able to type in answers, but we just have this to signify that, you know, we might want three responses. There could be three different questions that, um, you know, a student could ask. So if someone says, hey, I watched a movie last night, you know, what would you want to know? We might say like, well, what movie was it? Um, did you like the movie? You know, did you have popcorn with the movie? Um, just to give opportunities to practice those social exchanges and to practice uh, formulating those questions. If you have younger students, um, she created a freeze dance challenge. Um, and there's, this would be the slide that you would present when the music is playing. And this is, you know, some of the samples of the slides when the music stops. So, you know, you would get freeze as a zombie. And, you know, we could read these out to students who may not be looking at the screen, but still participating, um, you know, or the students would have to actually look at the screen if we do have a group that has their cameras on and they're able to handle that. Um, and they would be following these directions. Scavenger hunt is another good one. Um, and this is highly underrated for older students. We did this with a group of older students in a high school site based class and they loved it. They love to show things that are around their house. Um, it was the one time that everyone put their cameras on, I have to say. Um, so the rules, you know, we're, we're presenting them with some clear cut rules. Um, you know, you have this many seconds to find the item. You must show it in front of your screen before time is up for it to count. And you can't use the same item for more than one category. So if we know that students may have difficulty leaving and coming back to retrieve an item, we may send a list home ahead of time to families and say, hey, um, you know, have, have some of these items nearby. And then the students can just hold them up. So an example is just find something with batteries. So students might hold up remotes, they might hold up, you know, different items. Sometimes we'll, we'll make it very broad, find something flat, find something round, um, find something weird, um, and, and just see what students are coming up with. Um, Amanda, I'm wondering if we could do our third poll um, before we move on. So just thinking about your students, um, you know, the biggest concern about distance learning. Um, we talked a little bit about student engagement and mental health. Um, sometimes we're finding that if students are engaged, um, the next challenge is that they, they're not completing the assignments or they're not able to show um, that they're, they're completing the work and we have to kind of get to the bottom of why that's happening. Um, I also included behavior and access. Um, behavior has to be approached differently because we don't have the same resources um, that we would have face to face that we do in distance learning. Um, students really need to be motivated to be there and to respond and participate. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to do that um, you know, on, on a distance learning platform. It looks like we're still getting a couple more votes in and then I'm seeing in our chat that we've got um, an all of the above answer and then okay. all, <laughs> and then also nonverbal students. Yes. Um, added in here as well. Okay. So last couple are trickling in. We're at 88% response. I'll give you guys just a couple more seconds. Okay. So let me share those results with you. Okay. So student engagement and mental health is is definitely a big one. And then yes, all of the above. And for our nonverbal students, um, I'm going to show you a couple of sites that um, well, one site that might be helpful. 
Um, the other thing we would do with some of those um, mission cognition slides um, would be maybe we're sending certain uh, materials home ahead of time. Um, and some of them might be communication, um, you know, icons. Um, so if a student has a communication system, we might add a communication icon to, um, to their, you know, textbook or just something that they could hold up um, so that they could respond. And I don't know if you all can see this, but we have things like this, like, so just like a little green thumbs up, um, a red thumbs down. Um, these might be just a simple example of, of something that, you know, we may send home so that students can respond. Um, sometimes we might do like an X or a check. Um, you know, if students can use the reaction buttons or they can chat, um, those are some options. Um, but we may need to look at um, additional visuals, additional icons that they can use um, so that they can show what they know. And, and for us to provide them with enough visuals that we know that they're able to fully participate and, and you know, it actually engage with us um, via Zoom. Um, other slide ideas we have are, are things like create your own. So just use PowerPoint. Um, think about games that you might play in a face-to-face -face setting, um, but you know you can transfer those onto PowerPoints. Um, simple questions related to social skills targets and also to help students with their executive functioning skills. So creating those to-do lists um, to scaffold tasks. Our next website is Everyday Speech, and this one is um, more expensive than the rest. So we obtained this initially through a grant, um, and we got the video only um, subscription. And then when COVID happened, um, they, they basically extended everybody's subscription um, to the full subscription, which includes the full curriculum for $50. Um, right now, currently, a full subscription would cost $300. Um, and they basically have units um, on social skills lessons, pre-K through high school. Um, the topics are really in line with social thinking concepts. There's a lot of video models, there's a lot of PDFs, and you can send links um, to families and to teachers um, through email. So they have an option that says send as homework, and you can email those links and they, they will have access to that specific item um, that you sent. They also have a variety of games, um, which students seem to enjoy, um, you know, and, and it incorporates a lot of the social thinking concepts. So social skills quiz show is kind of like a Jeopardy um, type of show. There's bingo. Um, social skills road race is another uh, virtual board game, um, and it incorporates a lot of those social thinking concepts. Um, there's interactive worksheets, and these are actually like click and drag uh, puzzles. Um, so if you have a, a student that you're able to share the remote with on Zoom, um, you know, students can actually take turns clicking and dragging if you're doing this virtually. Um, you can also send these for homework. There's an option to print them out as well. Um, they also have Everyday Speech World, which is kind of like a virtual uh, interactive um, kind of uh, platform where what you would do is choose who you want to talk to in the room and they give you options of depending on what the person says, what's the best response, what's the worst response, and then talking about why a person would feel the way that they would feel have, had you responded in a certain way. Um, before I go to Boom Learning, which is our last site, I just want to show you um, the social learning platform. So this is everyday speech. And what you have is, um, these are the curriculum topics. So you have play skills, self-regulation, emotional recognition. And when you click on them, you get goals. And they're broken up into you know, elementary and middle school. And they're broken up into units. Um, and what you'll have is a unit like this. So an introduction to feelings, reading facial expressions, and then some games at the end. So our last website is Boom Learning. And this actually is kind of like Teachers Pay Teachers. 
Um, but they are a nice platform to use on Zoom because you can play them in real time. Um, you can share your remote so that students can actually, um, you know, click and drag or type the answer in or call it out. Um, and it's a nice opportunity to practice this skill. So depending on which um, membership option you purchase, um, you are able to make your own decks. Um, there's a lot of free materials on Boom Learning, um, and then you can also purchase other teachers' Boom cards. Um, if you want the option to send um, materials to your students and have the data recorded, I believe you have to have the basic, um, at least the, the basic um, membership, which is $15. So the boom cards look something like this. And for students who may not have verbal skills or are more cognitively impacted, there are a lot of errorless um, types of activities. So just matching um, you know, picture to picture um, and being able to click and drag for sorting and things like that. This is just a little bit of a higher level definition of emotions. Um, we have other things like expected and unexpected behaviors. So during free time with friends, you say your shirt is so ugly. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? And when you click on them, it gives you feedback. Um, these are just screenshots at this point. There is an option to type in answers um, on some of the boom cards. In some of the boom cards, you're able to embed videos. Um, for students with executive functioning skills, there are boom cards like this where we work backwards with the planning. So what will this look like when I'm done? What are the steps that need to be completed? And what materials do I need? They have options like completing a Venn diagram. Um, so this is something that, you know, if, if you're working with students who are uh, needing to organize their writing, um, maybe they're comparing and contrasting. A teacher could type this in. Students, if they're able to share the remote, um, they're able to type it in. Um, and then a picture can be taken of it, a screenshot, and it can be emailed to students for, for their writing activity. Um, so here's some considerations for planning. Um, basically, building rapport, <laughs> um, creating that investment to increase student engagement and hopefully increase their participation. Um, implementing expectations and structure, um, just like you would in, a, in an actual face-to-face -face classroom, uh, making sure that we're staying flexible um, and keeping our activities short. Definitely less is more. Um, you know, we always talked about in a face-to-face -face classroom, ending when things end or end on a positive note, um, end even earlier. Um, end your activities even earlier on the distance platform um, because it, it just helps students build endurance um, and, and just think about different ways that students can respond. And here's just another option of sending that visual toolkit or some similar materials home so that they can engage in the same activity that we're doing on the screen. So I just wanted to share really quickly a few additional slides um, that I would use if we were putting together a lesson. Um, and then uh, I think we'll have some time for questions. Um, really quickly, um, Amanda, can we put up that last poll? <coughs> so I just wanna gauge which res web website resources you may want to try. Um, a lot, of, a lot of these were, were really helpful for us. Um, it is a learning curve um, just to be able to organize and to get comfortable with incorporating these into Zoom. Um, a lot of times after we do this presentation, people just say, I'm just gonna go back and look at some of these websites. Um, and then little by little adding in some of those activities. Looks like we're still getting in a couple more responses. Okay. Um, so I'll just give you guys the last couple of seconds to get your responses in. Um, I did get some feedback on the last one. Not everybody saw the poll. So if you do see a poll button at the bottom of your screen, go ahead and click on that. If it's not coming up for you, that might bring it up. Okay. 
All right, I'm going to end that poll and share the responses with you. There you nice. Go. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, um, more than one is always good. And I would definitely, you know, just take some time and look at everything. Um, if you have questions about the, you know, each website, um, you can definitely feel free to let us know. Um, we can help you navigate some of those things. Um, and sometimes what we'll do is, you know, if before we're starting a group, we might put up some reminders. Um, so I would, I may share this on my screen as the students are arriving. Um, and in some of these things, you know, since we're already deep into distance learning at this point, we don't, we don't need as reminders anymore, um, but some students need them. Um, and we might put up some, just a simple list of some things you need to have by your computer for that day. And I find that those are helpful for students, but they're also helpful for parents if parents are assisting students with attending or with accessing materials. So for some students, we might need a visual schedule. Um, we might need something that, that does have pictures um, so that we can actually um, you know, show them that the, the tasks are ending and that we're moving on. Um, this out of presentation mode, you are able to click and drag um, these icons um, from the to-do list over to the done list. Um, if you have older students who are reading, um, we might do just a simple to-do list and in PowerPoint or in Google Slides, we would use that cross off option. Um, so just giving them some kind of, you know, sequence of activities. Um, some of our students are using check-ins like the five point scale or they're using check-ins like the zones of regulation. So just presenting those items that they might have seen in class on the Zoom platform is really helpful for them to use consistent language and to just better describe how they're feeling when they're on the Zoom platform. So we might do a quick warm up, something like a quick would you rather um, answer and pass it on so they get to choose who they want to, to ask next. Um, and sometimes what we'll do is we'll say, you know, you can either answer verbally or you can put your answer in the chat. If we're sending materials home, maybe we'll send the duplicate pictures to students who are nonverbal and they can hold it up. Which one do you like better? Which one would you rather do? And then what we might do is move to a boom card. So this one is just, whoops, this one is just, um, you know, a social media using inferences boom card. Um, and I'll show you my, my boom card library here. So what you might have, and this is for maybe older students who are using some social media, um, you know, interpreting hashtags. Um, and what we would have is activities like this. So just, you know, they're going to look at the pictures like they're looking on social media. They're going to read the caption and the hashtags, and then they're going to choose the one that best supports the picture. Um, so they're, they're getting those inferences. They're getting, um, you know, some of those things that we would expect kids to use on social media, but making sure that they're interpreting it correctly. There is also an option here um, on the boom cards for them to be read to you. So for students that have difficulty reading. Caption, James and I this. stand warm at the park today. So there is an option for the boom cards to be read to students. Um, and that sounded like ominously echoing on my computer. <laughs> um, okay, so then we might, you know, after we take a break, we might move to a video on everyday speech. Um, communicating online, and this is also for an older student, um, making sure that they're interpreting text messages correctly or interpreting social media messages correctly. And then we might do a follow up and say, okay, what did you hear? So based on that video, what did you learn or what were the things that were important? We would type it out here in bullets and then we can either send that or take a screenshot um, or if students are, you know, using a cell phone or something like that, they can take a picture of it and it can be used later on um, if they have an assignment that they're going to do offline. And then we might have students vote on a game um, and, you know, play a quick game at the end, um, incorporating a break, maybe, you know, in between these activities. Um, and we're meant to do them quickly. Um, so we're just really looking at um, moving quickly, incorporating those breaks and giving kids opportunities to show what they know. So we might be on some of these topics for 
a, a number of days, depending on um, you know what what students are are working on um, and and how they're progressing on the distance learning platform. Um, so I think Amanda, um, I think we have some time for some questions. Um, Great. Um, so back, I think when you had your seek slide up, we had a couple uh -huh. of, of questions. Um, okay. So. Um, one of them is, I think right at the beginning, is how do they get access to slot, to your resources? So that was one of them, because I don't think that was in our particular handout slide. Is okay. that an online thing? So um, I actually, let me go back to, on, um, it's loading. So on the handout, if you have access to the slides, um, the resource pages at the end actually have all of the websites to access the online resources. Um, so there should also be, um, so I see the four websites here. Um, and then also um, on the SEEKS slide, there is a website. So um, her website is listed there. Um, so you should be able to access it. And if you can't, um, Amanda, I can email you um, just a, a resource list with all the websites with active links. Um, so I can do that as well. Okay, that would be great. I think there's a lot of people who would love to have kind of a one spot to go to look at those resources. Sure. There's been lots and lots of positive comments about them. Great. Um, and so this one is a question also around that same time when you had that up. So this is from David McNelly and he said, we're an online program River Academy. Some of my older students are enjoying the online experience because it gives them more control over their choices and environment. Are you seeing ASD students who are enjoying online learning too much? I'm setting up social meets via Google, but it's difficult. Yeah, um, so what we've noticed is, um, especially for older students who are into gaming um, and, and who are proficient at technology, um, I, I find that they are enjoying it. Um, I find that they have a little bit more confidence than they would in a regular face-to-face -face setting, um, especially during breakout, breakout groups or breakout rooms. Um, they're utilizing the chat appropriately um, and, you know, when I would observe them in face to face classrooms, if there was a group activity that would be really hard for them and you could see them having difficulty navigating initiation, um, you know, and and handling the responses from other students. Um, I don't know if I would say they're enjoying it too much um, because I, I see those particular students having difficulty with things like organization. Um, they still need help with planning and, and producing content. Um, if we're talking about um, enjoying it too much by meaning that they're on the screens for, for a really long time, um, some suggestions that we've had is, you know, if students have kind of a to-do list during the day, um, that to-do list includes getting off of the screen. <laughs> um, you know, whether it's for, for 15 minutes like mid-morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon, you must go do something else and have that scheduled um, so that they, they are not on the screen for, for longer than we want them to be. That makes absolute sense. Um, I'm seeing a comment says, I'm noticing some students and adults seeming more comfortable in social situations virtually. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so towards the end of your talk, um, kind of leaving that general area, um, they're talking about engaging students who can't access that laptop on their own. Um, and do you have any thoughts about social activities with family involvement? I don't want to have families burn out. And I think it might yeah. be nice to do some social bonding while practicing the skills. Definitely. Um, and Mission Cognition was really good about talking about that in their webinar. Um, because they they come from a, a telehealth perspective um, where you know there's a parent training component so if you're if you're involved in like early childhood um, you know you have those parent training sessions um, where you may incorporate some families um, what you might want to do ahead of time is is contact the family and say hey we'd like to try this 
um, maybe send home like a list of the activities um, and maybe have the parents say, I think I can do this one. Um, because we, if, if we have parents who, you know, are, are willing to sit with their kids and try to engage, um, but they don't necessarily have the tools that teachers would have, um, this is a great learning opportunity for them. Um, so we want to make it something that the parents will buy into and that they'll feel like they have confidence um, and that they're doing it correctly. So you might have to do a little bit of back work um, and just give them the rundown and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. If, if your student responds this way, this is what we're going to do um, and, and maybe talk them through it. And if you are in a special education setting where you have the opportunity to do a quick one on one session or, you know, a small group session um, that might be a little bit easier for parents to to be able to handle. Um, but start really small and make it really, really short. Those are great ideas there. Um, so this one is related to Canvas, actually. So um, Carly is wondering if any of these resources have already been created and are put into a Canvas-friendly lesson. Ah, so um, these are pretty easy to um, put onto Canvas. Um, what you would probably do is if you have a teacher page um, or you know a, a therapist page or something like that, um, what you would want to do is go to the website and put the specific link there. Um, Boom Cards gives you an option, and I can, I can just pull it up really quickly. Um, what you can do is um, you can create classrooms to send it to, and it, it is designed to be able to, whoops, to be able to send to specific students or specific families. Um, but what you can also do is create a fast pin, which will give you a link. Um, and the link will be good for a certain amount of days. You could post this link on your Canvas page and then students could access it that way and play the activity. Um, the only thing that you should know about that is that it won't give you data. Um, so you won't know if the student played it or not. Um, if you want the data and you want that verification that the student played it, you're gonna have to send it to the student directly. Um, you would be able to put the everyday speech links onto Canvas. Um, there's an option, I'll show you. Um, when you click on a, a unit or an activity, there's this option here that says send as homework and it'll give you a link. And you can copy this either to Canvas and email um, and then a student or a parent could access it that way. Great. Um, Anna Morehouse is wondering how your organization paid for the social skills cards that you discussed at the beginning. Did each school receive a card or was it one per district? Um, so that came from um, regional funds. Um, so our autism department, um, and I'm, I'm going to try to explain this correctly. Um, so our services, um, you know, are, are basically funded regionally. Um, so a lot of that funding came from those regional funds for the school district. Um, we do have price lists, um, depending on how many students with autism a district had, um, and, and depending on what um, special education directors wanted, um, they determined how many carts, um, you know, a, a school would get. Um, so, you know, sometimes it, the carts would go to, you know, all of the site-based classes or the resource teachers. Um, sometimes it would go to an SLP. Um, it would kind of vary, um, you know, district to district. Great. Um, so I, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up questions now since we are at 10 o'clock. Um, if any of you still do have um, ongoing questions or questions that we didn't get to today, um, please feel free to email me. You should have my email because I've been sending you out all the handouts. Um, it's Perez A at C B I R T, which is Siebert.org. Um, and I'm happy to forward this on to Amy so that we can um, get those answered for you. Um, 
There will be an evaluation being sent out early next week. I know several people have been asking about recordings so they can go back over this again. Um, and I will send out um, a copy of this recording with that evaluation. And for those of you who do need um, continuing um, like professional development units, those will also, there will also be a certificate available for download at the end of that.